Did you know, for every one cell you're human, uh, you are 10 cells microbes, and 90% of them are in your gut. So you're more microbe than you are human. You're like a, a walking zoo for all these microbes. Um, and they have, and, and they're, not, they're not bad, they, they play a, 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 an important role in maintaining human health. Or well, that's at least what we're starting to understand now. So 90% of your microbes are in your guts. Um, many different functions, but particularly in the context of multiple sclerosis, uh, the gut microbiome uh, has an influence on the immune system and in return the immune system has an influence on the gut microbiome but that that interaction makes it really exciting in the context of MS which may be a disease which is obviously driven by the immune system I mean other cool things 90% of your serotonin is produced in the gut um, that may be very important people are spending a lot of time now looking at the gut brain axis um, and there are very ex a lot of exciting studies um, in that area. It probably stems from a paper in Nature from two 2011 from a group out of Munich and their findings are really interesting. Um, Germ-free mice, very difficult to trigger um, EAE, the animal model of MS, um, so in the germ-free environment, not till you transplant the normal gut microbiome into the germ-free mice can you trigger EAE. So it does seem that the gut microbiome is, is perhaps needed to trigger at least the animal model of MS. Um, many groups then have studied gut microbiome or are studying gut microbiome in MS, but it's definitely an emerging field. We were here presenting on um, Tuesday at, at, uh, on paediatric um, MS and gut microbiome, just a small uh, case control study. 18 um, uh, kids with MS and 17 healthy control children. On the, the, the large scale, we don't see a huge difference in the gut microbiome composition between cases and controls. When you're looking at big measures like diversity, such as evenness and richness, um, the closer taxa level, or sort of the close-up level, we did see differences, um, and those differences were pretty interesting. It's a cross-sectional study, um, so we're really just looking at, at what's there in terms of um, like a census of the gut microbiome, but those differences are quite intriguing, and we can see the microbes that we seem to be picking up, we can see those also played out in the literature in terms of inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's um, and ulcerative colitis. So, yeah, it's interesting. Hypothesis generating. Pediatric MS, I think, is a really powerful um, place to look at if you're interested in what might cause MS because you have a real problem in the, in the adult who may present in their 30s or 40s, they've had a lifetime of exposures and it's really difficult teasing out um, what might have be related to, to triggering MS. But in the child, um, they've not lived for very long and it, it's kind of easier to get a life history from, from the parent. They often know, you know, were they breastfed, how were they born, when were they vaccinated? And it's much easier to, to look at things like their diet. So if you want to know about the cause of MS, pediatric MS is a, is a, is a powerful place to do that. Really excited to announce that we've just got um, half a million dollars from the um, Canadian MS Society to look at gut microbiome in paediatric MS with Brenda Banwell's team. So that's now a study that will be moving forward um, and um, we'll be using the, through Emmanuel Welbomb, we'll be accessing her um, cohort of cases and controls through the US Paediatric Network sort of as a validation cohort. So we are collecting poop um, in the coming months. Validation, we really need to validate our earlier findings and look more at the, the, the function, functionality of what these gut microbes are doing. We also want to look at the gut virome in multiple sclerosis, so look at what viruses are present. And I think that's going to be really interesting. I have no idea what we're going to find. 
I mean, I'm particularly interested to see if there's overlap with other conditions. So we seem to see this overlap with inflammatory bowel diseases. You know, is there a gut microbiome signature that's specific to MS? Or is there some kind of generalized um, shift in the gut microbiome that's similar across autoimmune diseases? I don't know, and I think that'll be interesting to, to see if we can look at that and tease that out. I mean, it could open up many different avenues. I mean, you start thinking of things like probiotics or prebiotics, and can you somehow influence the gut microbiome to normalize it, whatever that is. We don't know what a gut, normal gut microbiome is, so, um, but it does open up different ways of thinking of MS. And one of the things I suppose I should have added, the big drivers in terms of shifts in gut microbiome we found in this pediatric case control study was immune, immune modulatory drug treatment. So the kids that are on um, one of the drugs for MS, their gut microbiome did look quite different from the kids that weren't on any drug. But it's a, it was a cross-sectional study, so I can't say drug caused that, but those kids look different. And that'll be interesting to see in this future study. We'll have longitudinal samples, so hopefully we'll have gut microbiome in kids before they start drug treatment and after drug treatment, and we can see the, if those different, if drug really causes a shift in the gut microbiome. I mean, ultimately, you want to find a, find a cure for everyone or, or prevent, ideally, you know, prevent MS. That would be fabulous. Um, yeah, it, no, it's very true. These kids with uh, pediatric MS, the children with MS, they, they, they have the potential to live a long, long life with multiple sclerosis. Um, and delaying that onset or it, preventing that onset ultimately would be fabulous, right?